going from profit-driven media to profit-driven prisons. We've talked many times on this show, Lewis, about the connection between private prisons, banks owning part parts of those private prison companies and the detention of undocumented immigrants. And we figured out how there's this conflict of interest where private prisons can make money off of the detention of undocumented immigrants and therefore now have a stake in immigration policy. We've talked about the connection between private prisons and the war on drugs, right? And how private prisons stand to make money from a drug policy that puts more nonviolent drug offenders in prison. Just makes perfect sense. We haven't explored how private prisons are able to make millions even when crime rates go down, even when you restructure drug laws to keep more nonviolent drug offenders out of prison. But Mother Jones has a really good article outlining this, and they explain how to take the example of the CCA Lewis, the Corrections Corporation of America. That's the nation's largest owner of private prisons. They've seen their revenue go up by over 500 percent in the last 20 years. And this is in spite of re uh, uh, of declining crime rates. And this is just fascinating the way this is happening. CCA is able to get they, they do a number of different things. Number one, last year, CCA made an offer to 48 different governors to buy and operate their state funded prisons. But the pitch, the part of the pitch that gives us insight into what is really going on behind the scenes is that there are occupancy requirements. So when the pitch is made, let's say I'm CCA and I go to a, a prison in Ohio and I say, we'd like to take over this prison. We think we could just take this completely off of your plate. However, We'll give you X amount of money for the prison, but we need an occupancy requirement that this prison will be 90 percent full at all times or 95 percent full or it could be any number, regardless of whether crime is going up or crime is going down. So as it turns out, this is pretty common in the private prison industry. There's a new report by in the public interest and they reviewed 62 contracts for for, uh, for different private prisons around the country. And 41 of those had occupancy requirements somewhere between 80 and 100 percent full. So the the reason for this, Lewis, is obvious. We can have a guaranteed stream of income. We don't have to worry about our prisons sitting empty. So what happens when crime drops and the natural level of occupancy might drop below the agreed upon rate? Well, the state then has to in order to meet its contract requirements, move prisoners from the state funded prisons to the private prisons. And then what happens? The, the state prisons are emptier and emptier, still incurring the same overhead costs. And you have taxpayers paying for state prisons that are increasingly empty while the state is giving these guaranteed occupancy contracts to for profit corporations, which have an interest in what I would consider unproductive immigration reform and certainly terrible war on drug incarceration policy. It is a horrible and corrupt and disgusting circle. It is despicable. And you know what? In, in occupancy guarantee, even outside of for profit prisons, just the idea of an occupancy guarantee for a prison is is mind boggling. Certainly. And a state prison would not have that, which is yet another one of the reasons why private prisons are going to be an impediment to improving war on drugs and drug related policy, reducing incarceration in favor of rehabilitation where it makes sense. Not that it always does. And and this the, the, the states that are going like Kentucky, which actually has now eliminated all private ownership of prisons. That's the direction we should really be going in.